Lincoln. Welcome to the Bridgewater Historical Society. Thank you for coming in on a nice hot gardening day, and I hope it's an excuse to get away from the black flies and a little nap maybe after all your work. We'll see. Um, I'd like to mention we have a raffle going on for an Amish, a handmade Amish quilt that uh, Brenda Needham donated. It's a queen size, and it's $5 a ticket and five tickets for $20. The drawing will be in October, and um, you don't have to be present at our annual meeting to pick it up, but we will find you if you win, don't worry. So uh, please buy a few tickets on your way out, we'd like that. Um, another announcement, the next program is on July 14th, and it's uh, Steve Taylor. He's gonna speak on the history of the Grange movement in New England, but he's gonna be speaking over at the Grange, so be sure to go over there, don't come here in July for that presentation. Seems appropriate to speak on the Grange at the Grange. Um, also, we have two exhibits this summer. We have an exhibit on Richard Thompson's World War I memorabilia. He was in the Motor Corps over in France. And uh, his grandson, Daryl Thompson, who's here, and their family gave us all the artifacts. It's quite an exhibit, and again, honoring World War I and Richard Thompson. And then on the other side, we have a new exhibit on um, Harlan, who's um, butternut desk. He made this butternut desk in the shop. His family had sawmills. They had the Curtis Booth sawmill that was over at the, where the firehouse is now, I believe, and this an A stretcher mill that is over where the ballpark is now. And Daryl just told me that his father, Daryl's father, sold the mill to Harlan's father. <laughs> Harold's father sold the mill to Daryl's father, which moved to Norwich, and Daryl still has some of the lumber, so if you're really desperate for dry wood that Daryl hasn't had a chance to use yet, you might be able to do a deal. Um, today, I would like to introduce Terry Richards and Bill Cagle with the Vermont Civil War Heritage Trail, and they're going to tell us all about the trail, its function, and all the uh, sites along the trail that we can go see. So I would like to welcome Terry and Richard. Thank you. Great to be here. Thank you very much. Very good. Bill. Sorry. All right. Um, thanks for having us uh, down here in beautiful Bridgewater. Um, Jeanette contacted us uh, over the winter, and uh, was, I appreciate your persistence because we had some lapses in our communication. We made it happen. And, uh, I appreciate you. <laughs> it's, it's wonderful to be here in your, in your beautiful schoolhouse museum. Um, Terry and I are on a committee working to save General George Stannard's house in Milton, his post-war farmhouse. And that led to our um, involvement in the Vermont and the Civil War Heritage Trail. Um, and we're here to talk about the mechanics of how, the, how it came about and, and tell you about the sites and um, open up to any, any questions along the way. We're going to be a little back and forth as we go. Um, Terry's going to talk a lot about the sites, and I'll be talking about the mechanics stuff, but we'll be, uh, we'll be interjecting between each other. So, um, why organize a Vermont in the Civil War Heritage Trail? Um, and the reasons are many. Um, for both visitors and for the sites themselves, um, there is a lot of hidden history, hidden to people unfamiliar with the area, especially of very significant sites within, within our state, especially along the Route 7 corridor. There are sites throughout the state, we want to acknowledge that. Um, in fact, right over here uh, in this part of the state as well. Um, but there is we want to help folks to discover the hidden history and, and how those, how the sites specifically are along the Route 7 corridor are linked and how they can be kind of digested in a, I wouldn't say in one day, but they can be digested in a, in a continuous sort of, sort of way. Uh, many untold stories um, related to these, to these sites. They open up a larger discussion of how they, they relate to each other. Um, and Howard, Howard Coffin, um, well, we'll get into the, the reasons, uh, the, uh, the inspiration behind, um, behind this some more in a minute. Um, we are hoping that the trail would spur on a, a new form of, of heritage tourism here in the state, not a new form, but a new, um, a new attraction 
Um, and we would like to be a kind of a reference to the sites that are off the trail as well. So that's kind of like want to serve as kind of a, um, a way for folks to get to know Vermont and so the more better as a whole. Um, among the sites themselves and the benefits that they stand to, um, to read, there is a similar purpose where we all want, we all want visitors to come, come to the sites. Um, we can share the resources that are created by developing this, the infrastructure of the trail and it, it, it helps all of us to get visitors. The spark of what got us started with the um, development of this trail. For us, Terry and I specifically, um, it was living in Milton and wanting to save the General Standard House. Um, and that introduced us to Howard Coffin and to other Civil War uh, folks. And Howard has, you've been on Howard's tour. You want to talk about Howard's, uh, how, you know, how that all works? The kind of excitement he generates? A terrific speaker, a terrific human being, a terrific historian, um, the expert of experts, at least in the Northeast, on the American Civil War. Um, He's traveled literally every mile in the state of Vermont. We'll get back to that in a second. The inspiration and what piqued our interest, Sparks, um, was as we were searching George Standard, we get little threads like, oh, connected to Bennington. Oh, he was in Colchester. Oh, he had brickyards. Or he had three brickyards. Huh. He was born here. The foundation of the house is still there in Georgia. Huh. He bought a farm here in Milton. Where in Milton? It's not marked. What's going on? Threads. Just getting overwhelmed with all this information that doesn't go very far. Just bits and pieces. Then, I stumbled across a book that Howard wrote 20 years ago, Howard Coffin with Will Curtis and Jane Curtis, Guns Over the Champlain Valley, where they start in Quebec and go south all the way down to Lake George, uh, illuminating the historical background and the historical treasures of, Ch of Lake Champlain, a third of which are unknown these days. Um, anyone familiar with Fort Montgomery in Rouse's Point, also known as Fort Mistake, <laughs> Fort Blunder. <laughs> we built it in 1814, about a quarter mile on the side of the Canadian border, hence the Blunder. Kids have been using it for drinking parties ever since. <laughs> it's just crumbling. Um, we go down the Hudson River. Where was the place that had all the GE PCBs going into the Hudson River? Do you know that? You know what was there? 300 years ago, the largest fortification in North America, which is now noted by a couple little signs on a creek bank. It's not even a river anymore. It goes down into the Hudson and some mounds, the largest in North America. And don't forget, you had Mexico, you had the Spanish, the Spanish troops down there, French. Who'd have thought? I played baseball as a kid. I grew up in Beekmantown, New York, metropolis. Uh, I played baseball in the cornfield, when you speak cornfield. And across the road was this brush pile and rocks. This book told me that that's Culver Hill. Culver Hill was one of the key battles of the American Revolution. It was a skirmish. But the British Army stretched from that hill in Beekman Town 20 miles north of the Canadian border, continuous. 150 locals, to be truthful about it, probably a couple of slaves, probably some squirrel hunters, 
one or two gamblers, one or two drunkards, a few farmers, about 25 guys held off, the British. Well, it was only about an hour, but that gave them time enough for Plattsburgh to be able to defend against that British army. That was the first battle of the American Revolution for Plattsburgh. Uh, others came later, the War of 1812, etc. Never knew about it. Was there five days a week for four years. Never knew about it. Time after time after time, this book reveals that. And I thought, you know, this thing was standard. What's, what's going on with standard? Oh, you know what? All this stuff seems to follow Route 7. And then you discover all the stuff that's on Route 7, which we'll get to. But that was the spark. A discouraging spark at times. Just keep unraveling the threads, pulling the threads. But we're there now. And uh, something about this is a, a more recent book of powers from 2013 that, that is more specific to the Civil War sites in Vermont um, throughout the state, which really uh, kind of drove home the the need to raise awareness and to to um, to get this stuff out there, like like Terry just said, including the gold mines up the hill from here. Yeah, it's in this book. It's right in, right in there. Every voter gold. So uh, the, the process was, uh, you know, we started with the house project in 2000, late 2014, and, and into 2015 we started reaching out to other stakeholders uh, and other <coughs> sites that we, throughout the state, to try to sense some interest in, in getting together as a group to meet, to talk about the possibility of forming a Vermont and Civil War Heritage Trail. And eventually we did meet, we had our first meeting, we had over 20, 20 people from various, from, from um, sites throughout the state. Um, we met at Ropey Museum, we figured that was kind of a central point in Ferrisburg. And, and kind of got the ball rolling, there was a lot of, we had a really good discussion, got, got the ball rolling on discussion of site choice, um, branding, how to promote, it just, it just it was a really a, a lot of brainstorming that first meeting. We got together again down in Bennington. Bennington wasn't able to come to the first meeting because it was so far south, so we went down to them um, a couple months later, and then we met in, in Rutland in June that year, and then um, that's kind of what solidified, June is what, so, 2017 is what solidified the content. Terry started writing and I, I did the design work, and we, we kind of solidified the identity and the, the sites that we wanted to, to highlight, and um, started pulling this trail together, and we got these, these initial brochures printed um, in July of 2017. Um, and we had a soft launch that, that later on in, in July of 2017, so it's been about two years now. Um, and we've had a couple meetings since to talk about what's, what's next, which we'll get to in, in a bit. Um, one at St. Albans, St. Albans Museum, and I, we also had one um, last June at the Vermont Militia Museum at Camp Johnson in Colchester. Um, so we launched last summer. We got the brochures printed. We, we have a website up. It's pretty rudimentary at the moment. We need to get, um, it's basically the brochure on, online <laughs> um, with a few Threads, like Terry was talking about, a few extensions that you know things you, you're limited in a brochure to what you can, <coughs> what other stuff you can point folks to, and and how much content you can pack in there. Um, so, uh, like what I was saying before, we want to be able to point folks to the all the you know a lot of other Civil War resources in, in the state. So that that's what we're going to do through the website. Um, that's that's something we need. Yeah, go ahead. Um, one proposed trail would be the Connecticut River bus. Training sites, departure points, return points for the railroad, all the woolen mills, the gun mills, or gun factories, just all up and down the river. A lot, lot of sites there. Um, from Rutland across the state, up across the middle of the state, same story. Woolen mill here, for example. 
and uh, could start at Rutland and run across and then get double coverage actually. We get twice. Um, all important, all relatively unknown, um, all deserving of a little attention, some honor and remembrance, um, an education that not everything is uh, new that we, uh, that we do and know. Uh, a lot went on before us. We're just we're trying to highlight, yeah, trying to highlight what's what's already there. Not make, not making new, new, um, not making anything new. We're just trying to highlight the, the, the significance of the sites that are there. Um, we have a Facebook page that we help to highlight Civil War related events in, in both on the trail and off um, whenever we we know that they're happening. Um, we may have made a first round of site identification signs go at the sites. Um, these are going to be kind of rolled out on June 9th. We have a, we have in, at the St. Albans Museum, July 9th. At, sorry, a month from today. Today is June 9th. Um, um, we're going to have a, a two-year anniversary party and we're going to distribute signs to, to site folks that come and we're going to have a party to celebrate the, you know, where the trail has come at that time. So that's where those are going to start to be distributed and they can be, be placed at sites so people can start seeing the, the, the kind of the, um, the identification and the kind of the branding of the trail. Um, we have a small committee that um, oversees the, the trail. Terry, myself, Alex Lenning is the director of the St. Albans Museum and he, he's heavily involved and we have few others that are, we're, we're kind of the most involved at this point. We have several others to uh, Angela Hinchy from Rutland and um, Tom Hughes Tom, of Millbury. Tom Hughes and a few others that are kind of in and out for various for kind of project type, type work. And I think once we get the more that we pull things together, um, I think we'll start start getting them more involved. Um, we attempted the, the last item I'll mention here is that we we did attempt last year to do a a regional interpretive sign project where you have kind of you've probably seen them outdoor angled signs Lake Champlain Basin style. There you go, sir. These the signs that you see at uh, historic sites that have photos and information take to take in about the site you're in. Um, Howard Coffin uh, got secured a, a matching grant possibility for us to put these these signs at 10 different regions along the trail and we started turning the wheels to try to make something happen with that but we, we really needed we needed a lot of involvement from the from the individual regions and it became a little unwieldy and, and the matching grant portion of it made it a little bit too much for us to take on at this time so we're kind of pulled back a little bit, we're going to work on what we can handle. We're all volunteers, so we're, we're doing the best we can on that. So that may, that may be something we revisit. But it did focus a lot more attention on getting that sign done for Burlington City Hall Park first, for those of you who love to visit Burlington. That's right. That's right. <laughs> Liam, Liam McCone, with, um, who's involved with this committee as well, Civil War historian, Fenian history his, uh, historian, author of Vermont's Irish Rebel, Captain John Lonergan. Um, he uh, has secured some funding to put a Fenian history, civil Civil War history um, interpretive sign in City Hall Park as part of their that, that park's being redesigned as we speak, and they're gonna be they're gonna have one of these signs about the trail. There there's so many so it's such a concentration of sites within Burlington, so it makes a lot of sense to have that be kind of a pilot for that type of project. So we'll see how that goes, and maybe we'll revisit for other regional signs at the appropriate time. Now we'll talk about the sites. I'll hand it over to Terry. <coughs> guide you from Bennington North. Anybody know what's on the right? That green thing? That is a famous casting of Lincoln suffering the little children to come on to him. 
uh, Lincoln's trilogy uh, that has won beaucoup awards and attention. And it happens to be the entryway to the Bennington Museum. Uh, Bennington Museum, of course, has a lot of Civil War artifacts, including a few things of standards, uh, camp desk, camp chair, um, uniforms, guns, a lot of stuff of standards is there. Um, but the rest of Bennington's got more. Could you speak up just a okay. little? The rest of Bennington's got a lot more. Yes. <laughs> the first veterans retirement home, oldest, is in Bennington. Bennington Cemetery has lots of Civil War and other veterans. The old cemetery. Um, the retirement home, also there. Uh, William Lloyd Garrison, one of the motors for the American Civil War, abolitionist newspaper, The Liberator. The first version of that, The Emancipator, was done in the two years that he published in Bennington, and then moved on to publish the bigger splash elsewhere. Um, coming up from Bennington, we have a little place in Manchester, which is not just shopping centers and outlets, not just Orvis. It also has something called the Equinox Hotel, which was around 150 years ago. It was around to the effect that the two summers of 1863 and 1864, it was the Lincoln family's vacation resort, two weeks away from Washington. They had reservations in 1865 for the family to take their vacation again, that those reservations were for the third week in April. And we know what happened in the second week in April. Vacation canceled come up from Manchester. And we run into Rutland. Barterville Hotel was a gathering place for generals and mighty politicians and generals' wives and parties for the military meeting place, including for Standard. Grant went there. Mrs. Lee, after the Civil War, uh, was at the Bardwell Hotel. The Rutland sharpshooters, Ripley sharpshooters, came from Rutland and trained at the Rutland Fairgrounds. Uh, coming up from Rutland, we get to Brandon. What's the claim to fame of Brandon, above all others? Birthplace of? Stephen Douglas. Stephen Douglas has some effect on uh, the 1860 election. Middlebury, Middlebury College. The university, the college that graduated the first black American student, Alexander Twilight, who along the way later in life became famous for building that great stone Brownington house, the one where he used the uh, ox to carry this stuff up to the top floor. We went up to the top floor, he killed the ox and ate it. Appreciation. Yeah, old stone house. Um, the great convention happened in a lot of places. It was not singular. The great convention would occur in a town where hundreds or thousands of people gathered to support abolition and freeing the slaves, and also <coughs> Union versus South. Big couple of those in Middlebury. Also the president of Boston College, no, president of Harvard, gave one of the commen commencement speeches there. Virgins. Virgins is a really weird one. 
Anybody know why Virgins might be connected to the Civil War? Neither did we. Not a clue. Meeting on the Green, there was a great convention there. Uh, Frederick Douglass spoke there, as did others, but that's not the biggie. Across the lake, in North Elba, New York, which in actuality is, I don't know, 20, 30 miles as the crow flies, lived a guy named John Brown. The spark of the American Civil War. Farmed there for, I think, five years. But guess where the closest place to do his family trading was? And it was not Plattsburgh or Rouse's Point or Albany. Or, it was Virgins. Um, with four wives, he had 20 children. So he didn't bring them all over at once, but he did fill a sleigh in the winter, crossed on the ice, and then came over on the ferry with a wagon full of kids, and they would spend three or four days, four times, four or five times a year in Virgins shopping. And many of the places and buildings where they were, both stayed and shopped, are still there. And if you talk to the right people, they'll be happy to point them out and say, yeah, the story about that building is. Who'd have thought? Excuse me, where was it from in New York State? What was the name of the town? North Elba. It's oh, okay. uh, at the foot of Mount Marcy, okay. Thank which you. is lovely in the winter. Thank you. Another, maybe off topic a little bit, but uh, it has been rectified, but my fiance and I visited the John Brown farm years and years and decades and decades ago. And something I didn't notice at that point, I just read about it a couple years ago. Yes, John Brown had black farm workers, and a lot of them and families, and treated them very well. Freed them, or did not take them in as slaves, he didn't free them. Uh, they were free to start with. Um, however, the Brown family is buried here, and the farm families are buried here. But they did move them. Somebody noticed it and squawked, someone with some power. So that was of some kind of comfort. Panton, noted for the Panton Ferry landing, how he came across. That's a sedentary Panton, but his body, uh, the cortege, after his execution, coming back up the East Coast. Lots and lots and lots of huge gatherings of people. The biggest, I believe, was Manhattan Railroad Station there. Second biggest was Regens. I have read in several places. Second biggest crowd was Little Regens. Ferrisburg has an historic marker for Frederick Douglass at the town hall. And even more than that is Ropey Museum, the Underground Railroad. Wonderful folks, wonderful museum. Lots of history there, and they know what they're talking about. Burlington, the Jewel City. Children. Ah, of course the Shelburne Museum. Civil War houses have been moved and set up there. Lots of Civil War memorabilia and art. Uh, even the wood carvings and the duck decoys have some representation there too. Uh, meeting place there, uh, a gathering for the convention kind of things and addresses. You can see a pretty good representation of the everyday lives of Vermonters at Civil War times, the Shelburne Museum. Burlington. Um, anybody know what the Howard Center in Burlington is and what it does? Terrific educational, charitable, anti-drug, etc. work. Howard, that name comes from Oliver Otis Howard, a general in the Civil War who after the Civil War was in charge of rest reconstruction and restoration appointed by Lincoln. <coughs> Lakeview Cemetery on Burlington Bay. Beautiful, beautiful old cemetery. Lots of plots of Buffalo soldiers. Lots of plots of Civil War generals. Vermont Civil War generals, William Wells, youngest and most quickly promoted general 
in the Civil War, and maybe of all time, I don't know anything more recent. A real whiz and a great general. And Oliver Otis Howard, and this other guy named George Stannard. <coughs> Stannard has a family gravesite there that is in the prime, prime, prime spot overlooking the lake. Has anyone been to that cemetery or seen Stannard's gravesite? Okay. <coughs> Atop the stone is a statue, a casting of George Jarrison Stannard with his arm, the right arm missing, as in the pictures you see. That is the only human <coughs> representation atop a grave in Lakeview Cemetery. That demonstrates the respect that was offered and earned by George Stannard. Wells House, Howard House, up on the hill, just up on the edge of the UVM campus, were also there. Uh, Battery Park uh, was a drilling ground and gathering and training ground. Uh, statues of Wells, huge statue of Wells in Battery Park. So lots of sites in Burlington. Winooski, on the edge of the Winooski River, a large woolen mill, number of large woolen mills, made blankets and wool clothing for the Civil War troops. Milton, Standard's house and farm from 1866 to 1871. Uh, foundation is there. House was built by the first doctor in Milton, built for the first doctor in Milton, 1839. Standard did some upgrades, updates, and successors have done the same. Georgia is the birthplace of Standard. Uh, there is a state marker, a large one, roadside, uh, noting the family farm. Just down the hill from there is what remains of the foundation, which is just earth. Earthworks are still there. St. Albans, the St. Albans Museum. Standard saddle and uh, trail desk and all kinds of things are there. Uh, George Conger sword recently, or one of Conger's swords recently made its way there last year. Yep. Uh, that's displayed. The St. Albans raid with the 14 raiders, bank, bank robbers, that came into town and just snuck in and stuck around for what, about five, ten days and knocked off all the banks in town and ran off to Canada. The trail, their escape trail, is a dirt sand road off um, out of Swanton, crossing the border. Um, we're trying to fit Alberg in, but Alberg is not. <laughs> there is a wonderful uh, museum in, it's New England via Vermont, and it's a Civil War history museum in Alberg. It's on Route 2, so it's a little off the trail, I and mean, we'll definitely reference them, but they have a really nice, it, it's a very interesting, it's, and a eclectic, it's a very eclectic uh, place to visit. Um, if you're ever up on Route 2 in the tippy top of, of Vermont, check it out. They're open seasonally, they're open now. And a couple more here in uh, the this other uh, Raiders escape route on 105, yeah, uh, in Sheldon, and that's where the Fenian raids happened. And um, we, have, we should note that um, Colonel Erastus Jewett, his grave, he's a Medal of Honor recipient, his, his grave site is, is in the Church Street Cemetery in Swan. Uh, oops, I'll make a note of um, we, Terry and I are both involved with the General Standard House restoration, so we have to mention that. Um, because there's a good possibility that the restored General Standard House in Milton could be a hub site on the Vermont and Civil War Heritage Trail. Um, the house is, has been surrounded, the barn that you see in the photo on the left um, has been gone since 1989, and surrounding development 
and the proximity and the the fast moving Route Seven um, made for the house made a need for the house to be moved um, from its original site um, to be better visited, easier visited, uh, more safely visited, and allowed the opportunity for for um, for reenactments and other types of events. And we we consulted with several folks, including the Vermont Division for Historic Preservation um, and Vermont Property Preservation Consultants, Alex Tolstoy and, and Building Heritage, our, our contractor who did, who worked to disassemble the house. Um, it's a timber frame structure. Um, it was disassembled this spring. We have a photo album of documentation of that work. Um, and we have web a website that, that that content will also be on. Um, so you can see a lot of the details of that of that step in the process. Um, the we plan to move the house to town-owned land in Milton, adjacent to what's called the Bombardier barn. It's um, the Bombardier family. Um, returns it more to an agricultural context of of the original site, and it allows us those opportunities to have a Civil War historic site honoring standard and the Vermonters' role in the Civil War, um, visitable and open to the public. That's our goal. Um, we've got a ways to go with funding. We've got, we've got about $20,000 in the bank right now after the, after the disassembly and storage um, of the components. The, right now, the house components are stored in the Bombardier barn near, near where, we want, where we want to reassemble it. Um, it's estimated we probably need to raise about another one hundred fifty to two hundred thousand dollars. So we've got a ways to go, and we're we're working on that now. Um, any any help is appreciated. Um, we have a lot of fun. We have several fundraisers uh, pieces that we're that we have available. T-shirts of Vermonters in the Civil War and, and standards on the other side of these. We have history mugs of standard. We're gonna we have a a pen maker. A woodturner in in Milton, named Gary Walls, who has offered to make us. He makes Civil War era pens. He's going to be making some special pens, monogrammed with with actual wood from the house. So that's going to be another fundraiser for us. Um, we're applying for grants. We have we we're actively fundraising. So we're, we're working on it. And um, General Standard turns his 200th birthday would be next. October 20, October 20th, 2020. We want to see how far we can get by then. Um, we can't. I wouldn't say the house will be open to the public by then, but to have it underway, to have the the you know the reassembly underway by then would be a, a great goal for us. Um, but we, it's a, it's a big goal for us to have this to be a a, a prominent site on the trail, um, and a real highlight, and a, a real reason to get folks to come to Vermont. For the trail and all of the sites in general. Standard highlights. Yeah. Go ahead. Um, George Standard was the ninth of fourteen children. Uh, in his teen years, farmed um, spring summer, taught school because he graduated from two local academies. Uh, taught school, and we know one place would be North Hero. Um, he taught school one winter. Um, after school teaching and farming, around 1837, he became a clerk at the uh, Smith Foundry in St. Albans. Um, anybody uh, in St. Albans who ever went to the Foundry restaurant, those were the offices for the Smith Foundry. The rest of that block, boom, was this huge monolithic building that was the Foundry. Most of their business was castings for the railroad. Happily, the Vermont Railroad was right across the street from the foundry. That's it right uh, there in the lower right. I, I suspect, yeah, that's what's left of it. Take that building and go over to about here or so, because the foundry um, became a um, finance, financial clerk um, in 1853, I believe. Um, did well. One of the owners wanted to leave the business. Uh, Standard became a partner. 1857 also got married then. Um, had to leave, of course, for the Civil War. 
uh, said to be the first Vermonter to volunteer for duty in the Civil War in the telegram he sent to the governor uh, the day after Fort Sumter. Um, distinguished himself at Harper's Ferry, uh, a disgraceful commander there, um, surrendered while Grant and Meade and a few others were yelling at him saying, don't do that. Uh, this guy did anyway. The last guy to give in was Standard. He had his escape route planned out and was going to stay and fight as long as he could and they had to send a uh, group of troops to convince the general it's time to surrender. Uh, when he was um, paroled in Chicago, and paroling was a whole other deal, you're kind of on your honor, but if you cross the line you get out of the prison camp then they shoot you, otherwise you did your own thing. Um, Standard was notorious for being a very difficult drill master, train, 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 drill, drill, drill. Uh, someone was complaining to him about that one day and he said, well, I just want you to remember the great old saying, a tired dog is a good dog. It worked. Um, 1863 came this little thing called Gettysburg. The Vermonters were down in Washington, D.C. on guard duty. All hands aboard, go to Gettysburg. They got to Gettysburg from Washington, D.C. in 18 days. Like 20 miles a day. On foot. In July. First, second, third. In wool uniforms. With guns, with food. And on and on. On foot. They got there, collapsed. Saw some battle the third day, or the second day slept through the first night with some contact second day third day is when things started popping pickets charge depending on who you read 10,000 to 50,000 troops 25,000 seems reasonable uh, if you've been to Gettysburg or seen pictures of Gettysburg and you walk that trail up pickets charge up to the hills and thinking Oh my God, what am I doing? No cover. Artillery raining fire down. It's a moving experience 150 years later. Very moving. Uh, standards, Vermonters happen to be in position uh, at the clump of trees at the top of the hill when Pickett changed coming by and suddenly they turn and they're presenting their sides and their backs to the Rogers and Standard. The decision of Gettysburg. Open fire. First com Full change forward on first company, as I believe the quote. And the Rogers swarm like a machine and just wiped out Pickett. After the battle, Lee was trying to gather commanders and find out what happened. And the last guy to make an appearance is Pickett, supposedly the last guy. And General Lee says, where are your troops? I have none, sir. You what? I have none. It was a big deal. Um, the majority the diagram of that of the, uh, the majority of historians, I think, say that that was the turning point in the high water mark of the South, the turning point of the Civil War. Had we not taken them at Gettysburg, we would have been wiped out because there were lots of guys on the way from the South. It was a big deal. Um, 1864, Petersburg siege. Everyone's headed to Richmond, trying to take over uh, the Petersburg Valley. Um, Fort Harrison on a big embankment cliff, can't get to it, Standard and the Vermonters took it. Took, took a little while, but they took it, captured it. Uh, the South really wanted that. North Standard's troops captured a spy, a Confederate colonel, who they took as a prisoner and interrogated him. And he started to bluster and said, General Standard, 
I want you to know that General Lee himself is commanding the next attack in the morning on this place and he has 67 million troops. Standard's reply was, well, should General Lee choose to call, we will be happy to receive him. And they were. Held off three attacks. On that last attack is when Standard lost his right arm to a ball shot. And they amputated on the spot. And that's George Standard. He had illness issues. He settled in Milton, where in the farm, the farm and the barns were unique because it was outfitted for a one-armed man. At that point, three years later, only one arm to use. And that's one of the essential values of the house and the barns. It was unique and very well constructed and reconstructed. Uh, retired as doorkeeper for the women's side of Congress, of the House of Representatives. And that was of some import at that point because that was a considerably smaller and less important location. The standard could barely stand at that point. It was pretty much an honorary position. And he died in 1886. The, the previous picture. Does he have something behind him holding him up? No. Those little feet on either side yeah. of his feet? What is that? I don't think so. There are other pictures on the stand. Yeah, it just looks like something is behind him, though. Yeah, you're right. Maybe it was a stool. Or but when you said that about him yeah. not being able to stand, I wondered if that was some sort of support. That may have been early. That could have been right after. I just wondered yeah. when you said he was becoming more debilitated. Because that mantelpiece doesn't look like anything in the house that we saw. So what's next for the trail? We're, we, we're, we're just going to continue um, enhancing it. And like I mentioned earlier, we have a, a second anniversary party in St. Albans. You're welcome to join us. 5.30 to 7 p.m. on July 9th. Um, we have a sign-up sheet here that if you're interested in learning more about the trail or the General Standard House, feel free to send us sign up here with your email address um, and uh, we're happy to send you more information about it. Um, we're going to get the signs distributed to the various um, to the various sites over the course of this year. Um, the trail would love some funding too as well to, uh, to help enhance to help these enhancements um, so that's something we're going to be working on as well. Um, and we're hoping that uh, you know a little more more engagement from the other partners once once we do some more, um, some more branding here, we're going to be, we're going to be creating. We were we talked with Alex and St. Albans uh, about this just a couple days ago. We're going to be creating packets that make it easier for the various regions to reach out in their area to create their own events regionally because we can't be everywhere. Um, so um, it will help to make the trail more kind of bigger and more more relevant for everybody. So we're going to continue on with that as well. Develop those materials and distribute those this year as well. Um, any questions for us? Um, does the Q code on the sign link to more information on that specific site or to your website or? Currently it's just to the, just to the website itself. Um, we did think, that's a good question because we did think about that, having them specific to that site. Um, that is something that could ease that easily, um, <laughs> you know, at all costs. Just a question of money. Yeah. yeah, it's something. Yeah, exactly. It, it would be that would be the that would be the ideal use. Wouldn't you? Wouldn't you agree? Um, that way, like here you are. Boom. This this is what this is what you're seeing. You have a great explanation. Um, hope to do that down the road. We also hope to create a video series. We've been talking with with um, uh, our local access television organization is Lake Champlain Access TV. We've got a couple up there, uh, Channel 17. Um, I the name of that one. So we talk, we talk, yeah, they're, so they're all the, the access management organizations of which um, this broad, this will be broadcast. You know, um, I know they, they all work together, um, but Kevin Christopher specifically has been coming to trail meetings um, and we're trying to figure out a way to get a video element to this together as well where the different uh maybe ha maybe do a video series 
where Howard Coffin could be the host, goes around to the different different areas and does does an interview where we have developed some good video content that could be distributed as well. Yes. Uh, who owns like the Standard House and the Virginia or the Virginia Railroad Station? Who owns those? Well, we lobbied for the 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 Standard House was privately owned and part of a, the, the parcel that was developed around it. It was owned by Greater Burlington Industrial Corporation when the farm got sold back in the late 80s originally. And then when Miller Realty developed the Gardner Supply Distribution Center right, right around it, that they bought the property. So we worked to, to get the, the house and the small lot around it subdivided out. And we, we, we asked our select board, for the town to take ownership of it, so the town, our, our town of Milton, owns it now, and we're the we're kind of the stewards of the project, working closely with our town management and staff and select board to try to to keep this moving and get get it restored. Seems like you're going to have to raise a lot of money to restore that. Uh, you are correct. <laughs> Why can't uh, Bernie Sanders get that uh, 200k? Why can't he? That's a chunk change in Washington. <laughs> <laughs> that would be that would be wonderful. You know, if we we're hoping that the right folks who you know val really value this heritage tourism. You know, we we're we're on the we the trail is on the um, connect. We contacted the the state uh, tourism folks, and it's on the state tourism website under you know kind of the their itineraries under Civil War. They have their, this wonderful piece that they put together with a committee, um, Vermont and, and the Civil War. This is for the sesquicentennial. Um, they put this together specific, specifically for that visitor's guide. And the, the Vermont and the Civil War Heritage Trail sits right alongside this as a Civil War related kind of offering. So, but the state isn't, as far as funding, the, the, the tourism folks, they're not. They're having their own trouble with funding, so so they don't. They, yeah, as far as um, we just we just appreciate the support from them. Um, one thing that Terry wanted me to also mention is that we, with Liam McCone's, Liam McCone, the, the Civil War historian and author, reenactor, and so many other things, um, he um, he authored a recommendation that General Standard receive the the Medal of Honor. He did not receive it. We were. Surprisingly, to us, to most, to many people, um, posthumous. We submitted this to, to Senator Leahy himself. Um, it's very, it's very extensive, very well done by Liam, uh, and I helped him kind of. And Bill, but it made it look pretty. Um, <laughs> um, it's, it's a. It has to go through army. It's been in the army channels, and it has to go through the army channels to. To be, to be awarded, um, we've kind of hit a you know, medal of honor, medals of honor for the Civil War are essentially closed. You know, they, they don't, they're not awarding them anymore, essentially. But Liam's not giving up yet. We're not giving up yet. There may be a way to make it happen. So we're going to keep working on that. Is there another question? I, I had a question. Um, could you go back to the? Uh, his history of the turning point of the Gettysburg incident and right. just explain that a little bit more? Almost unanimously considered the turning point of the Civil War, not just Gettysburg. It was obviously the turning point of, of Gettysburg. Mm -hmm. uh, the Union Army and Standard's troops essentially wiped out the best combatants mm -hmm. of the Confederacy. Uh, absolutely not expected. And the fact that uh, Pickett had made the decision to just waltz by the Vermonters did cause some who were severely discontent. Yeah, we, were, we were severely outnumbered, so he he, yes. he probably thought he didn't think we, that the Vermonters would be a, a force to be reckoned with. Uh -huh. Little did he know. <laughs> and the great quote from there that's on the back of our shirt from. Uh, General Doubleday, yes, that Doubleday. Uh, good God Almighty, look at the Vermonters go at. Oh, in our, it's uh, in our brochure, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. This one's put the Vermonters ahead from Sedgwick. And then General Sedgwick later said, uh, put the Vermonters ahead, don't ask, march uh, faster and longer. 
and that was based on the July 1st through 3rd treks all the way from Washington. Thank you. Your question? Well, two things. One, <clears throat> excuse me, I don't know if you had applied for funding from the Byrne Foundation. They're actually, uh, particularly if it's connected with education, uh, uh, it's a philanthropic organization organized by, at this time, one woman. Uh, Byrne, I think it's B Y R N E. It's it's a name, it's a proper name. Yeah, sure. It's kind of an unfortunate name. We, we have not yet, but that's, that's great to know. So, just to share that. Okay. Um, and then the other thing is, there are, I'm sure people in the room who can talk more knowledgeably than I, but our Bridgewater Mill here, it's off your path, but my understanding is that they supplied blankets, uh, woolen blankets during the Civil War uh, to the soldiers, as well as, okay, so it's in your, <laughs> you're, you covered it. Are the Cleachy Mills in there as well? There's Dewey, Dewey's Mill and- Everything is in there. Really? Yeah. Just the detail. Hmm. Right. <coughs> But do you think that at some point you would get to the uh, place where you would be able to have little offshoots from the Route 7? We encourage uh, that, but that's yeah. not going to be our thing. We've got enough to uh -huh. do with Route 7 right, at this okay. point. Thank you very much. Right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> we'll help. We'll help yeah. uh, and make a great, you know, generate awareness and, and point folks mm -hmm. to that. But as far as creating a, a kind of a cohesive structure, let's kind of start with this for now sure, and see. See how far, you know, see how much, you know, we can enhance this. If, it, if there's a logical point of literally branching out like that, um, we will definitely entertain that. Mm -hmm. We'll definitely need some energy from from folks on other, you know, on those other points to, sure. to, to help make that happen. Of course. Yeah. Yeah. A local boy, Francis Clark, and his brother Charles went from Bridgewater to the Union Army. Both fought at Gettysburg and came safely home. This is why I love history. My degree is in English literature, so it's not that far a step. The night of July 2nd, 1863, Francis was at a picket post far from the main Union line, where the hard fighting had occurred before. He wrote, he wrote home the next day, and this is what I'm getting at. And I'll read what he wrote. The grace and education and communication of that man and a whole lot of others, frankly not as prevalent today as it was then. You read the letters of these guys and think of where they were when they were writing these, handwriting them. Quote, here and there the moon revealed amid the trampled grain, prostrate forms, whom no longer roll or revelly could rise again. The air was tremulous with a sound low and almost indescribable, resembling a far off and just audible moaning of a forest of pines. It was a groaning of the wounded swelling up from field and wood and blending for miles in one low inarticulate moan. After fruitless searches for water, I wrapped myself in my blanket and with the wounded on either side, lay down to sleep. With upturned face to the mild majesty of the queen of the night, as she looked down so calmly upon us, and with flitting thoughts of home and friends and other times breathing a prayer, I fell asleep in between the wounded and the dead bodies. And he had the intelligence and presence of mind and spirit and soul to write that. why we do this. Any other thoughts, discussion, questions? Well, thank you very much. Thanks for having us.